Hello, Johannes. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you. Hello, Mahmoud. How are yeah, you? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good pronunciation as well of my name because we were I... uh, discussing the <laughs> pronunciation before we started recording. I did spend some significant time in Jordan and Syria as a child. So, Ooh, as a yeah. child, how many, yeah. how many years? Uh, I mean, all in probably one and a half. Um, the longest stretch of time in a row was six months. Uh, when I was six years old and then over time more and more plus Turkey and other places, but back, this is in this, how old am I? This is more than 30 years ago. I'll leave it at that. So early, <laughs> early nineties, uh, I was six. My sister was three. My parents took a lot of time off from work and took us down in a Volkswagen to Jordan to Aqaba, Petra, Vladirum, lived with Bedouins in the desert. Unfortunately, my father regrets it to this day that we never made it into Lebanon. We did try to get a visa. I didn't get in. We spent time in Damascus, Palmyra. Uh, so. Interesting stuff. I mean, so that it's, it's just out of uh, a strong sense of adventure, I presume. Not yeah, my, uh, work or anything related. No, no, I, my, no, my parents didn't work there. And uh, he, my father knew uh, high Arabic. Um, so he was able to get around. My, my mother speaks French. So yeah, we, we did, we were able to get around with hand, with hands, feet and everything. We actually did in, in Vadirum in the desert, we did spend time with the Bedouins and learned how to find water in the desert. Ooh, nice. So uh, if the apocalypse uh, <laughs> is happening anytime soon, you can probably fend for yourself. I, I will <laughs> make my way to Petra and restart civilization from there. Where they didn't so, even need, you know, didn't even build anything. They just carved it out of the stone. Which is it's quite... it's amazing. I mean, now it's completely overrun with tourists, but back then there was no one, almost no one at least. Yeah. What the? So one because you mentioned that, like one one memory besides the the bad one, or maybe it could be uh, that as well. Any anything that left you with like a strong impression and was oh, stuck in your memory there's so many uh yeah mostly yeah, well mostly the people in both countries the uh hospitality um the 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 naturalness with which they are in which how they are hospitable to 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 strangers and foreigners i remember for example the shuk uh the bazaar in damascus uh, my my name patron is, of course, you know, uh, has his grave in the big mosque of Damascus. That's uh, Giovanni Battista, John the Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember distinctly, and then I think this was on one of the other journeys that we uh, took there after the six months uh, stay, which was in Damascus. Um, we we met someone on the streets and I don't remember the, exactly why and how my parents started talking to him. He invited us in. He lived in a tent, a, a, a tent somewhere in Damascus. And we, we I was quite young, so we didn't really understand uh, that the man probably doesn't own very much. And he basically gave us all his food. He had uh, bread. Um, and he just let us, us meaning my sister and me eat um so my, my father gave him a us dollars afterwards uh, to make up for it but he wouldn't have asked for anything and i remember sitting in that tent and that's that's really 30 years ago more than i don't know maybe i was seven so yeah that's that's what i remember yeah that's uh that's Nice. I mean, that's one thing about also Lebanon. I usually hear from yep. from people as compared to maybe other places. I'm not really sure because my experience is I, like I cannot compare my experience in, in Europe versus in Lebanon because I'm, I'm I'm Lebanese. That's but they they're usually excited to see to see people from across the globe. Right. The, the tourists, they're yep. happy to, to meet people. 
uh, you would just show up and then everyone is yeah inviting you over or wanna <laughs> Sometimes it can get overwhelming, I think, because they're like, yeah, let's let's do this and do that. And they're automatically kind of your friends and they want to take you on on hiking trips and show you around uh, the city. I know that my, myself because uh, two, five, five years ago, I think, uh, in front of where we were living, in front of our building, there was a hotel. Yeah, I was going back home and I hear two people speaking Spanish. I was like. Because I, I speak Spanish, I was like, hi, I introduced myself and we ended up like having a chat. Afterwards, we went for uh, drinks and we walked around. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, pro I don't know, it's it's natural kind of. I wonder how it is in, in Europe from a tourist perspective. Well, we, I think we were the only Europeans <laughs> almost. There were a few bikers. Um around Aqaba by the beach, I remember, but we were basically almost the only Europeans. It, it did change over. Things changed. Years. Yeah, yeah. No, but I meant like, <laughs> I wonder how it is in Europe from, from, you know, uh, oh, okay. When you come perspectives. In. Yeah. I don't know. It's probably <laughs> depends on the country, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Some, some yeah. regions in Italy, you, you, you can, they're very hospitable too. Sicily, for example, especially the more South you come in Italy. Um, so. But. Yeah, I wonder if it's a Mediterranean thing or or something. But uh, but yeah, and uh, how's the heat wave now? Because it looks <laughs> like it's quite hot. Well, it's are. we've we've got um, it's becoming Mediterranean, so I'm, uh, you know, having come here from Italy, I'm very grateful for the heat wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, for the, I don't know how, how it was, but uh, in our case, I, I am living in Salamanca now, Spain. Uh, the past two weeks, we almost haven't uh, or didn't see the sun, but then I think summer already started. Like today, it's 30 degrees, I think. So, yeah, sun is out again and yeah, you can feel the vibes. But uh, anyway, let's let's see how, how this goes when it comes to... Uh, how hot things can can get here it can get quite hot where i am up to 40 degrees sometimes oh i thought i thought you dry mean dry weather i thought you mean in, <laughs> in conversation uh, i mean <laughs> i'm i'm trying to avoid hegel at all costs uh but but we'll we'll get into that uh the so we've been following each other i even i i forgot uh, how many years we've been following e each other on on twitter but the fact uh, that you four. mentioned that you read my yeah. free fall of academia article then that means that we've been following each other for <laughs> quite a lot and yeah. uh i think we have similar kind of paths in a way uh disillusioned with academia we teach online philosophy courses although we differ in our approaches because my approach is more uh you know simple popularizing philosophy keeping it you know at uh, just not more than an entertaining kind of activity and in your case you are pretty rigorous and you dig deeper into the subjects and topics you you give so tell me about your journey starting you know ever since you i don't know where you you studied yeah, so uh, philosophy all the way to how you uh, ended up teaching philosophy online and founding an academy. That's so we came back from Jordan uh, in 1991. <laughs> and I remember that what uh, my sister and I were most pleased with was seeing our toys again. What we were most or I was most displeased with was that school started. Um, I, I have been looking forward to school. I couldn't believe how incredibly boring school was when only after a few weeks, I had to realize that there's not much to be learned. Um, and that, unfortunately, that continued for the rest of my entire time at school. I went to, because, you know, you made a mistake, you asked me to begin at the beginning. And where's the beginning with you? Know, so, I'm oh, sorry, okay. And I and, uh, uh, start whatever you like. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I, this is, this is why we do podcasts. I mean, so yeah. even if uh, this so turns the, out to be like a four hours thing, I don't mind, but yeah, go the, ahead. The, the, two, the two people still listening. Um, 
will now have to uh, listen to this. So I I went to a gymnasium, as they call it in, in, in Germany, which is uh, in in Italy, a liceo classico, a classical lyceum to learn Latin and ancient Greek, because I thought uh, I was nine or 10 that learning those languages would introduce me to the mysteries and secrets and the the workings of the world. It took, unfortunately, it took quite long until I had one very good teacher. I never had a good Latin teacher. I had one extremely wonderful ancient Greek teacher called Marcus Ferber, who really brought the language to life. And when you take Latin, you, you know, you read Cicero, you, you read Tacitus, you read Ovid, uh, Virgil, and in Greek, obviously you read Plato. We read uh, the Republic, the Apology. We read the Timaeus. We read the Pre-Socratics, Thucydides, Aristotle's Metaphysics, the Physics, the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, you read the poets. So you come out of school. I did uh, because I took it until the very last already having read some of the most fundamental texts in in European Nerd. philosophy, European philosophy <laughs> uh, in the original language. And after a few years of uh, not knowing um, really what to study, I studied a PPE, as the, uh, the English call it PPE. In Italy, it's called Economia e Scienze Sociali, so PPE is Philosophy, Politics and Economics. But in Italy, it's, <clears throat> it had a very strong focus on economics. So I have a a mathematical uh, background in I had to do all kinds of things like stochastics and uh, other weird calculations. So I have a background in economics and maybe a little bit, uh, that's where my understanding maybe of, of business also perhaps comes from. And because now, as you know, I, <clears throat> I run a business basically. Uh, I don't think of it that much in that, in those terms, but, I, it, it is a business. So, uh, but I also had a very good, uh, philo I had a very interesting, um, teacher there who's, his name is Ivo de Gennaro and he, he taught philosophy in a way that is very unique. Uh, we did, we read almost no texts. It would all just came out in discussion beginning again with Plato, Heraclitus, going to Kant and, and Nietzsche and Heidegger, et cetera, and Leibniz and a few others. So the initial excitement uh, with, with the Greek uh, philosophy came back. And so I was there. This is, a, by the way, in Bolzano. If anyone knows, this is a very good university if young people are listening. It's very small. It's trilingual. So you will have to know English, German, and Italian to finish. Uh, you also have to take exact subjects in German and in Italian and like private law, etc. That's Italian. Um, so it's a very just, I think it's a great uh, study program because you, you get to understand a lot of how the world uh, works. And, but that, overall for me it became clear at least i thought at the time that what i'd like to do is to become a scholar so quite early on i thought oh well you know why not become a professor of some sort or a lecturer so i focused on that for the better part of 10 years then 2008 to 2018 when i finished um started studying in 2008 finished in 2018 with the PhD. So yeah, I left Bolzano in 2012 and then went to England. Uh, why England? Why England? May I ask why you ask why England? Uh, because I don't know, it's like you, you could maybe have stayed in Italy, went to Germany, uh gotten some sort of offers across the world so was it for example a job offer were you doing a post oh no 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 i was just i, I just so the in in italy that was just a degree that was just an undergraduate 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, England. So, ah. well, I did, I did my master's there. Oh, oh first, okay. okay. Uh, at at a place called King's College in London. Yeah. Uh, not the one in Cambridge. And the, the reason was quite uh, simple. I didn't have a degree in philosophy. So German universities didn't accept my application uh, because I lacked five credit points or 10 credit points. And it was absolutely no problem in England. But also, you know, there are these just horror stories about German academia anyways, if you want to go down that path. And uh, even though it's not great in the UK, at least at the time still, it would have been a more uh, transparent uh, process um, how you get actually you know, because there are lectureships there are no lectureships in in germany there's only lehrstühle chairs etc so the, the way to getting to the point of becoming an academic is is longer uh usually more difficult and off very often no one talks about this uh most people fail and they fail so miserably that when by the time they're 50 they have nothing They've got, yeah. you know, a professor, they've got the habitilation, but they're unemployable. They're actually by law unemployable by a university by that age if they have not received uh, a call to sit on a Lehrstuhl on a chair. So there's a cutoff age. Don't nail, don't nail me down. Don't nail me down on this, anyone. I think it's around 50 or 55, but there's some sort of cutoff age when after this, you won't be able to receive a call. You may be able to do some teaching, but you won't be able to employ. So it's getting better now, but back at the time it was still, so there's all these stories. Anyways, I went up, I went up to, to uh, London and stayed and went to Warwick afterwards to do my PhD because I found uh, Miguel de Bestegui. And also if for Heidegger, um, and Miguel uh, accepted my proposal immediately, so that was uh, uh, you know easy enough to get in. And uh, Stephen Holgate was there. I know you know him. Uh, maybe you I may be aware of him. Hegel, uh, Hegel scholar, but you may you may know Warwick, right? I think you. Uh, the only guy I think he was in I don't even know this is uh Bristol a I might have I know someone who uh Ben Berger I think he, his name is I think he got his PhD from work as well if I'm not mistaken but I don't know many people at work no well to make it short I wrote a thesis now book on Heidegger on death and being um, in those four years and left in 2018. That was pretty quick. And you finished uh, your your PhD afterwards. What did you what did you do, or what were your goals initially? Because you said you well, you got I... into it because you wanted to become a scholar. And so, what happened? What happened? Like academia happened. <laughs> tell me, tell me. This is I'm I'm trying to <laughs> to get there. Yeah. What? Uh, tell me. Uh, before looking... we get into Heidegger and and all that. Oh, I don't uh, want to jazz. talk about Heidegger. I, uh... No, not 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 Heidegger as such, but then also the the interest. But before that, yeah, yeah, let's. Uh, I'll I'll do something I never usually do, but why not? This is the book. Uh, oh, you actually I was published just looking it. for it. Yeah, yeah. Heidegger so... on death and being. Man. Yeah, pub published nice. by Springer. Um, and so it took me three and a half years to write the whole thing. I have, I also have to admit that I am an autodidact when it comes to Heidegger. So I frequented my first, uh, ever Heidegger, uh, lecture course as a first year PhD student. And I remember Miguel saying to, I said to Miguel, you know, can I come, can I, can I join you? Can I just listen? He said, yeah, but this, you know, how many times have you heard a lecture course on being in time and I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did tell him that it's the, the first time. So I, I taught myself Heidegger, uh, in the years in, in during my masters. And when I got there, I, I just kept reading and writing. And so I worked really hard. I mean, I did, you know, I did everything basically that's required of you. So I, I went to conferences, I, I published papers, uh, but, but it all, but it's, but it, you see that there's there's something about the machinations it's not that so you hear people say 
young academics, you hear them say, well, you know, if I'll, I'll just be, I'll just bend over backwards for a couple of years or decades until I get to a position of power where they can't fire me anymore. And then I'll say what I really want to say. Right. You know, you know about this. So you hear that and then you go to conferences and some of them are good, but most of them are utterly terrible. They're boring. You have to pay to give a talk. Uh, it's, and they're all playing, you know, there's so many, I mean, I don't even know where to start, but <laughs> so, and over time, and I, I actually, I, I didn't play the game that much. I, I submitted a few proposals to conferences, sometimes got accept, accepted, sometimes not. I published a few papers, not with the greatest journals, one of some of them in German, which is worth nothing uh, because it's all, you're, you're ranked by the, by the, the impact of the Q1, channel. Q2, Q3, it, it, Q4. It's, I, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it doesn't matter what you write as long as you've quoted the right people and it's in the right journal. And it's got, so that's how your impact increases, et cetera. So it all, it's just, and this was very different, even just probably 30 years ago, you know, the people who made Warwick, one of them being Miguel, another one, Stephen Hawker, they published books. They had almost, and by the way, when some of these uh, professors who are now retiring, when they started, they had no publications. And now you look at some of the, of the publication record of some of the people who then actually end up getting nothing. It's I don't even know if these people ever sleep. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, kudos to you. It's great that you can publish that much. I just wonder whether that doesn't do a disservice to philosophy itself when it's just about publishing or perishing. Uh, and it's doing actually a disservice also to the so-called hard sciences, uh, as you know, the replication crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So there's huge issues, but also... Overall, it's just the lifeblood just kept disappearing, even though there were great uh, uh, people. But it, it seemed very suffocating overall. And there's all kinds of other issues, of course, with academia. Um, like there are no jobs. Uh, you have to growl in the dirt <laughs> and hope that someone will let you teach a course. And even when you do, I, I ended up at Birkbeck, uh, which is a, a small... Um, college in in london um when i quit two years ago or more than two years ago and now and i you know good that i did because they're, they're actually cutting down about 50 percent of their department or even more uh so the, and the department won't exist any longer it'll, it'll be one humanities school <clears throat> so Plenty of issues, lots to complain about, but I'm, I never, I never really wanted to complain about it either. I just looked at it in a certain way and I thought, this is like, this is a terrible, you know, people will think this is horrendous what I say, but it's a, it's a market. It is, it is, and people, you know, they speak of the chops market. So when it, when there is a chops market, then it's a market and it's a skewed market. Um, and <laughs> as it's a, it's <clears throat> it's inefficient. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, by the way, I'm not a neoliberal. I'm not a libertarian. I don't think markets are great. I just look at the, this is what it is. It is a market, but it doesn't work. So, and you, by the way, you have to be kind of in business anyways, because all conferences, the, the, the important conferences, they're basically just there to network. Uh, the big ones in America, for example, they're like, you know, fairs where you APA, can yeah <laughs> yeah that one and then there's the the phenomenology one that i yeah and then there's all these you know so it's it's a weird kind of a business that actually as schopenhauer says you know it doesn't cover its costs um life is a business that doesn't cover its costs right so um so over during that time, and this was also 2015, 16, this was when, you, if you remember, this is when Jordan Peterson became all of a sudden burst on the scene. And the only thing I found, uh, what I found interesting about that is that there was podcasts started to emerge at the time that went into just 
outlandish uh, topics that you didn't hear anymore inside academia, where literally any every single talk I heard about Nietzsche was that there's a there's a tension in Nietzsche. Oh, you, really? You think there's a tension in Nietzsche? <laughs> you think that the philosopher of tension may have found a tension? Did you? So it the, the sterilization of some of these thinkers that was so it found sort of the the the, the pressure was released somewhere else. Um, and it's obviously it's not just Jordan Peterson, but he. he he was one of the biggest at the time. There were others too. Um, and there were all these YouTube channels that were already um, bubbling up. I was working in the media. I worked at Vice yeah. a decade ago uh, in 2012, 2014. I actually, I interviewed did they, John. Did they, did they not, ju was it Vice that went, almost went bankrupt now? Or is it? Well, they uh, are. They, different... So, well, it's not, it's not my yeah, business. Recently so it's... kind of. Well, they've, so. So what? Very briefly on this, because no, but advice, it's them, right? Or it's not the yeah, yeah, it's, it's not it's, another. It's yeah, them, yeah. but you know, it, it's. I would say you cannot really go bankrupt when you've never actually turned a profit. So they've. They, this is one of the excesses of the past decade. Is that you had companies like Vice that produce content that should tell something to everyone listening that content production is not making will not. Earn Earn you a living like vice was valued at 5.7 billion dollars if anyone who believes that it is just not really you know not really in the room so that should, should be obvious that it never made any money it was they always underpaid people because they, there wasn't all that much going on it was just smoke and mirrors um they did have some funny stuff and radical content. And there was a lot that was possible. I interviewed Michael Sandel, for example, at a time when Michael Sandel was still huge. I think he may still He's be. The, uh, the, is it Harvard, I think? The, Harvard uh, Justice. Yeah, ethics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. Like I've seen um, one course of his. Yeah. So I, st I stayed because of, 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 of things. Like, I mean, I was never um, fully employed by them. Uh, I interviewed John Gray. British uh, philosopher yeah. a couple of times. Uh, the feline I, philosophy guy and dogs. Well, <laughs> yeah, now. But, but <laughs> no, no, then. but I mean, he's he's known as for for those listening. He's he's that guy. <laughs> well, he's also known for uh, his radical critique of progressivism at a time when people like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and others were were proclaiming new atheism as basically the new religion, the, the high rationality, etc. So he he was the closest thing to a French intellectual the British Isles will ever see. Uh, he, he has he has his severe um, limitations because he obviously also is just a Darwinian uh, and cannot really tell you much beyond uh, mere contingency, but he can point his finger to the excesses of a belief in progress. And he thinks that it's a, a bad myth. So all these things happened at the time. So I had media experience already. I did have a very successful uh, media website in Germany that I ran myself for a couple of years. So this is all about a decade ago, 2012, 2015 or so. I had to um, leave much of that behind because of the, the PhD work, as you know, it takes up a lot of uh, time and energy, et cetera. And I've always been so I had a an affinity for these uh, things and for some reason also way before the podcast uh, uh, era i wanted to record videos and put them out on youtube i had this idea in 2013 14 but back then i i didn't even know where so i did a few trials but i didn't know where to start they all look terrible now it's so much better it's everything is so you just use an iphone uh, back then, the iPhone camera was not good enough. So that never came to pass. When I had finished though in 2018, I just started with the absolute worst uh, camera quality you could imagine just to finally start. So I put out a few videos on on 2001, A Space Odyssey, on, um, on Heraclitus, a few on Heidegger and Parmenides. Yeah, and that's basically how it started. Around the same time, I also started teaching at Birkbeck, 
2018 in October. I met, I lived in London, so I started, lived, moved back to London from from the um, from the British, from the English Midlands, where Warwick is, and met a few people who Adam Adam Toth, for example, who's a great photographer. If anyone's in London, you should uh, you should have your portraits taken with Adam. Adam Toth, Adam Toth. He he filmed a couple of videos of mine, um, so that helped. But it, I had no strategy or so. I actually just used it for for talks and lectures I had written that I knew would never get published anywhere else. So it was an outlet. While at the same time, I was working towards publishing my book, which you know, is a very different way of uh, writing. So I used it for that. Um, but it very quickly led to people like uh, Guy Sangstock uh, reaching out to me. I don't know if you're aware of him. He'd be interesting to talk to for you as well, perhaps. Uh, and and through Guy, thankfully, um, also John Verveke, who you might be aware of. And so one thing led to another. I knew Justin Murphy. I had met Justin. You would probably be aware of him. He'd be a great... Uh, guess too i think so justin and justin started his thing around this and we were always in touch back then i remember he because he moved back to the states he lived somewhere in the desert and we we were on the phone quite often trying to figure out ways of, of what could we do uh to uh well to make a living uh, with this and at some point we we figured out what, let, let's just try doing a course and I I had read a consult you know a book on consulting. I have a good friend in London. I won't mention his name because he's not really in the public. But um, <clears throat> he taught me a few things. He's a, a political consultant and and brand consultant. You know, because what's the difference? Um, <laughs> uh, and he taught me a few things, which is how I ended up uh, understanding how you you price something, what you offer. I did a I did a I did an online course on on business during that around that time too, but that's basically all I knew. And then we started offering this one course, which just about happened. And I found you around that same summer. I read your piece, and there was another one you wrote. You wrote, I think you wrote two pieces on academia. I don't quite remember, but um, we were in touch back then, back and forth. You were already thinking about perhaps leaving or not, or were fed up with it. I was already on my way out. Um, on my way out, at least in the official, because I still, I mean, I, I still go to conferences, but only when I get invited, right? That's the, the funny, the funny thing is now that I don't have a job, I get invited to Cambridge and I, I gave a lecture in Bologna last year, uh, <laughs> on transhumanism yeah. and, um, and, uh, I just, I just got back from a Heidegger conference in Tübingen. I'm going back to Germany in October for a small seminar on on Nietzsche. I will be in Bologna next year for a one-week block seminar on uh, Humanismo, Transhumanismo, so it'll be probably in Italian. Uh, but yeah, so that's, I'm still, I have friends inside academia, but I'm free enough, right, that I don't have to follow the rules, let's say. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so we offered the course on Deleuze and Heidegger, that's Murphy and me, and that happened to be just around the time of the first lockdown. So when the world ended, I began. <laughs> uh, I offered my first, and you stop me anytime, right? Um, okay, that's I, uh, that's good, man. That's um, I'm enjoying this. So yeah, yeah. So, I. We offered this. This was on technology. It, it, so first lockdown. Are we talking March? 20, yeah, this is twenty. March of twenty twenty. And around that time, I also finally published or set up the website for my, well, the Halkion Guild and Academy, uh, which took me, because I have no idea how to do these things. I, you know, I use one of these platforms that are easy enough, you know, let you build a website. Uh, it took me a week or so of intense work because I, I just thought it's time. Halkion has, has been a name that's, that's been with me since 2010 at least, which was a, a year during which I intensely 
read Nietzsche and Nietzsche quite often speaks of the Halcyon uh, Halcyon self-sufficiency or the Halcyon uh, tonality or melody. Uh, the Halcyon or the Kingfisher, the ice bird is a bird. It's also got, uh, now you're going to call me a nerd again, but um, it is, uh, it's, it, it comes from Greek mythology. But with, even without the mythology, for example, Aristotle speaks of um, speaks of the the kingfisher. Uh, it, the the iceberg is is relevant because he the the iceberg breeds in between, um, or right around winter solstice. I mean, so seven days before and seven days after, it, when the sea is still, the sea is still and quiet, and there's no tempest. The weather is fair. Fair enough. So in winter, when life recedes, this bird brings new life. Hence, Helkion also aims to bring new life as we are, which Bengler are children of the winter. But so the first course then I offered, this is March 2020. It must have been April of 2020. I set up my the other website, which is I use Teachable as a platform, um, which you know is is quite expensive, so it's a big uh, decision to to do this, and I wasn't sure whether this was going anywhere. So, but anyways, I tried, and I offered a course on Otium cum dignitate, leisure with dignity, on Plato and Cicero, Aristotle, Nietzsche, Humboldt, Bertrand Russell. Martin Heidegger and Joseph Pieper, I think, at the time also. Maybe not him. Maybe this is a new one. Uh, but anyway, so we spent seven or eight weeks together in during the lockdown, 12 people enrolled. And yeah, we had a very intense seminar discussions for about two or three hours each Saturday evening. And... Out of that, a lot uh, emerged. People started reading groups um, and got to find the others, as it were. As that, was it Timothy Leary or so who, who said that? I don't know. Uh, and as it had been, you know, it's it was just a, a good time. And I didn't have to do anything else at the time because Birkbeck had shut down and everything was basically shut down. I just continued to throughout the summer. I offered a course on my book. Um, so on Heidegger, Death and Being. The book wasn't out yet, but it was a, an, a, an occasion for me to go through the, the text with others while I was editing the whole thing anyways. And once that was done, I wrote a new course on Nietzsche. So this is something, you know, in, in some sense, I just <clears throat> do what what used to be done at universities before they became became too mechanized. So when you are just allowed to, oh, you know, Mahmoud, I know you've got an interest in Shelley. Um, you, so you could just teach on Shelley. You don't have to ask the bureaucrats whether you're allowed to teach Shelley and in what way. And then you have to teach the same course every single year. Because only in this way, when you teach the same course every single year, they can evaluate whether students really like it or not, according to the evaluation sheets. So none of this, I mean, we look at, for example, what Heidegger did, right? Heidegger, wrote one of his books is Introduction to Metaphysics. I mean, the entire text has got nothing to do with metaphysics whatsoever. He talks about Sophocles and uh, Sophocles' Antigone. Uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, I... Is it the one where he spends like the first chapter on on being and isness? It could There's be, another yeah, yeah I yeah but uh, because we in, we in, had in to, translation yeah we had to read that and I don't know if it was intro to metaphysics or something else and existentialism like go figure yeah yeah oh. or 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 his <laughs> his teacher uh Paul but yes Nato. they were all like he he wrote yes this is this is the thing like he would write uh, a book <laughs> based on his course that he's actually and and you see the book like 
in the book yeah. you, you it's it's lectures as so he's he's talking it's, to his students lectures. and the public yeah it's it's lectures and and none of them are you know sorry for uh, i'm looking for a book yeah, yeah don't, none worry, of, don't worry none of the lectures are this is what aristotle means by substance yeah this no, is how no, a, no, this no. is this is how we understand substance or essence in aquinas this is how we do it today analytical uh, so-called analytical metaphysics, which is, by the way, a side joke of history that they've turned uh, to metaphysics again, but that's a different story. I'm looking for a book and I can't find it. It's okay. That's, it's it's by Paul Natewerk. That's one of Heidegger's teachers. It's called Philosophische Systematik, Philosophical Systematicity. And Natewerk, in that, that's a lecture series too. You hear the title, you think that's the most boring thing ever. Um, and it turns out to be, by the way, here's one by Schelling that you will probably appreciate. Philosophie der Mythologie, philosophy of mythology, presented yeah. once in Munich and somehow preserved for posterity. I'm reading this at the moment. Um, so Nator, in this book, or in, in this lecture course, you know, there, there's passages in there that are so wild, um, they're so free. And this is what I try to do also in my lectures. So I don't try to present... This is what Hegel means by this. Or I don't even teach Hegel. That's Philip Nicholas. But this is what Heidegger means by that. I'm, this is what he means by this. I sit down. Either I've written something or I just read. And as I read, I comment on the on the text that's recorded. And then we go into the seminars where we, again, go all over the place in some sense uh, and experiment with what is going on. And also because of the the disembodiment that comes with Zoom, uh, which has its perils and its dangers, obviously. But so the seminars officially are two hours long. But for some reason, for since last year, since one and a half years now, for one and a half years now, the seminars have been three or four hours long. The people just don't leave. I, I sometimes I, I have to go now. I've, it's, I'm done. Uh, and then they, they 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 stay. Some of them just stay and keep talking. Yeah. Uh, and and I think one of the reasons is not just you know the the medium. It may it may be the medium, but it is also that they're there because they've they're not they get nothing from me. I mean, and nothing. I mean, they get they get no. They don't get a PDF that says you've completed this course. They don't get. Obviously, there's no accreditation for the course. They can't seek accreditation because I'm not accredited. Um, there's no marking on the essays, but people still write essays. They send them to me. I give them comments. They can present them at the pro seminar. If they want, we publish those talks. So they learn how to present in public, read out a text they've written, get comments on, our, on others. I refuse the word feedback, by the way, because it's cybernetic language. And... Um, and if they're really good, I publish them. And I mean, I, I publish the, the written text. So, you know, three years later, um, that's, uh, how it's emerged. And well, this is, this is extremely uh, fascinating to be honest and that's why I mentioned at the beginning like we have two different approaches to this because I I, I, right. I do the same thing they don't get anything uh, back from me but in my case yeah. maybe my my target audience is, is different so I, I limit it at just the zoom calls which also dragged uh, for sometimes even five hours <laughs> yeah you told me <laughs> we, we just have have these discussions and but yeah there there are no essays although i do offer this uh, this this option but yeah but yeah you're you're right so this is there are several things here uh because you mentioned you know the the course as a as an ongoing process where you're testing new material kind of i wrote an article a few uh weeks ago about praising the process which is not like in praise of the process and I was, it was, it's, it's a weird kind of convoluted article because I was genuinely struggling at the beginning. I, I said, I'm, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm just putting it out there and made the comparison between stand-up comedy and, and, 
you know, teaching philosophy, being in academia. It's like it's we don't or it felt as though we didn't have that anymore. It's like a place like supposedly classes, you know, it's you have a seminar, you test, you test out new material. You're trying to come up with new things. And, and it's 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 funny that you mentioned this now. It's so I was thinking, like, why? Why is this not the case anymore? And you also mentioned something along the lines of the market is uh, is uh, is inefficient and th like so many things. I'll, I'll try to make sense of what I'm going to be saying now, put things coherently. So one, based on everything you're saying, don't you think that the way academia has become now and this has affected the way classes are given, lectures, etc., and conferences and, and, and the publish or perish. Don't you think this is this kind of uh, mechanism has been introduced because now uh, there are more people graduating with a PhD in any field than there are uh, slots open? And so like eventually, maybe 30, 40 years ago, and you're right, you go on JSTOR and, and you find like an article written about Schelling and you read it and you're like, <laughs> seriously, it's like this guy published this in this journal. I am almost sure I can, like I wrote much better stuff than this person and I cannot even get it published in a Q4 kind of journal. So don't you think that they somehow needed to put some sort of mechanism and this is like to just give academia the benefit of the doubt. And you know how much I I, <laughs> I dislike how things are being done now. So, but it's at some point like they need to control, find some sort of between brackets, right? Objective criteria, yeah, you, yeah. You, like, you know? No, obviously. And this yeah. is why yeah, yeah. ultimately this affects the way you, you, <clears throat> pub, you, the courses are given, the courses that are being, et cetera, et cetera. And because we, I well, I'll exclude myself, you, because I honestly, my my kind of stuff is is different. It would be, as I said, popularizing philosophy. I'll leave the uh, more serious stuff to you. But because we are, we don't have, we don't need to prove ourselves to absolutely anyone except for the actual market. It's like if people keep signing up for your courses, then you're doing something well. If people stop signing up, then you're doing something wrong. And this can be so like your signal is much different than your peers trying to judge whether or not your material is, is good or bad. I don't know if this makes sense. So I said so many yeah. things here. I don't know what you what you think. So, yeah, they, they had to introduce certain things, but also just, you know, certain, let's say, mechanisms. But that's so I think the root cause for this is the so-called the massification of the university, which which means is not just a mass overproduction, which is a horrible way to phrase this, but that's how it's put, right? Of PhDs. I mean, that already tells you something about the entire so-called mindset um, and <clears throat> of, of, of academia, um, if we can speak in those terms. So the, the, the massification, I mean, is that the, the assumption is that Basically, everyone has to go to university. You know, Tony Blair in, in the UK, education, 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 everyone has to have a degree. I mean, if you want to work as some sort of middle manager, you now need to have a degree in just about anything uh, and, and uh, maybe or even a master's um, degree on top of it, which now, of course, also sets you back tens of thousands of pounds, which um, makes you a, a pretty, you know, well, a docile employee, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so, but it, the, the root cause is the massification. But I would also say that if you look back on some of the articles written that you, we now find in JSTOR, of course, there will be terrible articles, but many will be, uh, quite a few will be creative and much freer than anything than we can find today i that's, was once that's that's what i'm this is actually what i meant like okay it's, it's not that they're shitty it's that they're like you they wouldn't be published nowadays because oh, no. they're they're freer and <laughs> yeah they, they, exactly like they're uh, they're written sometimes they don't even have proper citations you know it's just like hey i i, I had this well, thought and i published it in this journal not because they're bad it's just because you know like 
it's yeah they were they they didn't need to prove their you know knowledge and so like you know your stuff i'm i've written this here you go uh what do you yeah, think and, you know yeah so you, you think of for example also the, the just the phd itself i mean you know heidegger's uh doctorate thesis you know you said i was very quick with my phd and i and i was and i i will have to say this i mean if 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 you know if someone takes seven, eight years or so for a PhD in England, uh, maybe they're not really cut out for it anyways, because they're not very long uh, in England. So, uh, but that's a different story, right? But there were people like Donna Bernard Williams, who does who, who did, he did not have a PhD. Um, and he was a professor at Oxford. He was actually a, a, one of the teachers of one of my uh, good friends who's also within without academia. His name is Simon May. Um, he's a so-called visiting professor at King's, which means that he doesn't have very much to do and he's free to write books. Um, so it's the, the the overproduction, the massification of the university itself. That's, that's the fundamental issue. And I think if universities want to survive, they will have to become extremely elitist again. They will have to go back to being... <laughs> Many universities, the so-called colleges, will have will have to shut down. Uh, so, but this is an overall, you know, it's a, how do you save the educational system? There's nothing wrong with going into vocational training at the age of 16. Uh, my father didn't study. He does, you know, he he doesn't have a, a PhD in art history. He's a restorer. He restores churches and castles. You don't need to study for that. People now study for this, and they come out of their studying their studies. And they walk into a church, they have no idea how to restore the church. What we're seeing now in Germany, also unfortunately in Italy, um, with an overproduction of people with masters of science and restoration, is that they have no sense for the building that they're in, no sense for the environment in which it stands, what a church is to a village in a certain time, that's unimportant. So there's a lot of destruction actually that's happening uh, in 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 restoration um, by overly educated people, um, and that is an issue. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, I mean, there's a bit of a the paradox, of course, is that I would not be sitting here without decades of first reading. Latin, then Greek, which I would say is also not for everyone. And it doesn't have to be for everyone. Why would that be for everyone? And then also, of course, I did a I did a PhD and that gave me years and years and years to myself. Um, so in in the future, the question is for me, and this is something I'm, I'm working towards, is how this can be achieved outside uh, the... Uh, 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 academia. And I think, though, that it will come about just in the way in which, for example, someone like Williams became a, a teacher. He basically, um, well, he, he stayed uh, at, at Oxford and became a fellow. And by being a good teacher and being recognized as such, he was just able to stay. And I think outside academia, it will be similar. You'll find people who come in, they turn out to be really engaged in the seminars. They put in the work, meaning they write or maybe even, you know, do podcasts or publish videos. And you'll see them over years, over years, over years. And they, if they keep at it, then they will become a fellow at one of, you know, the, for example, my institution or someone else's. Um, and so we'll build up their, um, their, or we'll make their own path in that way. I see this is, this is yeah maybe uh, <laughs> and i i agree with with that but um i was a part-timer at at one of the universities i taught at in in lebanon for seven years yeah i have a phd in philosophy they have uh my student evaluations over seven years two courses each semester and despite that, I was still 
kept as a part-timer yeah for political reasons so it's like even sticking is not is not a guarantee and yes for political reasons in in this particular university yeah that, so but that's that's it's, that's it's, what it's, it's quite interesting that this is this is the thing it's like nowadays it's you you can't even guarantee that because everyone is like anyone can show up and they'll be happy to teach as a part-timer because of the job market and then so at one yeah. point i was like yeah screw it i'll i'll leave and i left yeah no but i mean this 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 is what happened you know with what was possible for williams at, at oxford could i think will now become possible at places like yours and mine and, and i remember seeing um something from you that someone who had taken a few of your seminars is now teaching his own course if i remember correctly um yes they co-teaching with me basically but they uh, uh, but yeah yeah, yeah. they're so yeah. they they like many many of those who uh so for example yeah i've uh, i've co-taught uh courses on uh, philosophy of money and philosophy and debt with someone <laughs> who took several of my courses because like even though i come from a my my undergrad is in banking and finance so i had absolutely nothing to do with philosophy i don't know if you knew that as well but despite that uh, i feel more comfortable focusing on on the follow, uh, philosophy aspect so this uh, this guy also comes from a philosophy economics background and uh, Anne albert yeah. so we 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 thought that but uh, but see this is a thing many people yeah and another another guy who took one of my courses he's in fact in Barcelona, he's uh, a Spaniard, or let let's not get into <laughs> that Catalan. Uh, Catalan. In this Catalan. case, I don't want to be well. It's it's a tricky kind of yes, but he he took one of my courses, and yeah, he eventually now he's he's given uh, one course a few a few months ago, and just recently he finished another one on moral dilemmas. So yeah, there's no. like more people are are doing that. Exactly. The, the same has happened uh, for us and, and also so at Halkion, but um, and but it doesn't and it's all very early stages. So this is the fourth year. Officially, I, I'd say we I started this in March or April of 2020. So three years and two months, if you want to be precise. But uh, I uh, what I've seen is um, and, and now it's at a point where actually people ask me if they can teach um, a course. Like, right, I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, um, so some people are asking me if they can teach. Um, John Verveke, of course, I, I asked myself if he would uh, be so kind and teach a course, but I can't speak for him. But I would, I would, I would think that for even someone like him, who's as you know very active on YouTube, the the what's What's appealing is that he can now teach a course beyond nihilism, which is basically the the second part to the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, um, without any red tape. So he doesn't have to ask anyone. He doesn't have to tell me which authors he's going to read. Um, I don't have no oversight over what he's going to teach. All he has to do is show up. And he will be prepared because it's John Verveke. Uh, and, and then he'll teach the course. He'll come in. He, lecture, he lectures for 45 minutes. And then people can ask him questions and have a group discussion with him. Um, and he does. So there's no. Uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing stopping him. And yes, there's so no micromanagement. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. So when I agree, even even yeah. when I invite someone, I invited Hani Hassan to teach. Uh, I know him from from university as well. We were uh, colleagues at UB, uh, and I invited him to to give a course on Islamic philosophy because this is his his stuff. And he was like, "Okay, so what do you want me to do?" I was like, "Man, just like you do your thing. I'll pay you. That's it." <laughs> We're, yeah. we're done yeah. he shows up and, and he does his things because this is what like you know so so uh, i have this i have a suspicion that you probably like star wars i do like star wars yeah yeah because only so i don't know you know speaking of nerds 
Um, but if you remember, Anakin Skywalker is rejected by the Grand, whatever the official title is, the Grand Council of the the, che the, 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 the Jedi by Yoda and the other schmucks um, because he's too young. I mean, he's incredibly talented, right? So, and talent will find its way. So he finds his way to Lord Palpatine. Um, because no, you have to wait. You have to wait. You no, no, no. Wait another fifty years until you're ready. Uh, this is where academia is at this point. You, you. Plato? So we, anyone? Why Plato? Until the age of forty, is it fifty? I don't know. Well, okay. There's nothing wrong with waiting in a certain sense, right? Uh, mm, got you there. <laughs> no, no, no. Careful, careful. So when yeah, when, yeah, tell me, tell me. But I'm, I'm curious. Like, I'm genuinely curious as to but, how, as, what, how as, would you? Because some people would tell you you need to get a certain level before you can blah blah blah, and then to you know. So how would you? Well, you always reconcile? need both. You always need both. Nietzsche says you're you're a child uh, at the age of thirty in high culture. Uh, to to quote him here briefly. But here's what's strange about academia. To give the counter example, in the beginning, you have to you all you have to come out of the PhD having published at least four thousand papers, and you need to have given fifty thousand talks uh, on on all planets in every galaxy. And only if you've done that, then you may be able to get a postdoc. Maybe, if you've got the right friends at the right time. Also, that's the part that no one talks about because it's not actually that impartial. Also, publication, by the way, is not that double blind as people Agreed. think. Agreed. Right. So, on the one hand, here you have to come out ready at the age of twenty-three, completely completed. But at the same time, you're being told, "No, no, stop! Just don't, no, no, don't do this. This is something you could do, but we actually don't need you to do this right now." So that's what I mean. If you see someone who's got talent, that doesn't mean, "Oh, you're twenty. Here you go. Do whatever you want." But because there are none of these rigid structures that are in place for God, who knows what reasons, um, you can support someone who's very talented. For example, Sean McFadden, who's just finishing a course uh, on the philosophy of the machine. He, yeah. he's young. He's twenty four or twenty five. He's, he's read an incredible. He's a scientist, uh, an astrophysicist, and a, a neuroscientist finishing up um, at the Technical University. Which Munich Twitter guy moment. signed up for it? I also saw. I saw you tweeting that. <laughs> Did he actually sign up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who signed up? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Of course, it's Mark. No, no. Andres. I mean, like, yeah. Mark Andreessen, who's, um, I, I, he's a some sort of Silicon Valley investor. Yeah. So I I've, I don't really know that much. I've more. seen as Joe Rogan. Uh, chats. Oh, I did. I so I've I've never heard him speak. For some reason, he started following me a few years ago, then unfollowed, and then followed again. And I just said on Twitter publicly said, you know, take this course. <laughs> so he's not in the seminars. He's only doing the self study, uh, thing. But so Sean, obviously, you know, uh, and then in general, someone, anyone who's who's young and who, who's good should be supported. So we'll, we'll just see what happens when he teaches the course. He did very well. Uh, will he? I think that overall he will need a few more years of uh, of, of focused reading in, on, in, in one tradition of philosophy. That would be my assessment of the philosophical so and that's always necessary and and always you know and obviously that's the first uh, course that he taught so there will be things that 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 can be improved that's always the case but you see that's the reverse of um is obvious and this is not someone who's like plato writing his own philosophy this is someone who's teaching as a scientist uh on philosophers who have tried to figure out what is going on in technology. So, um, yes, I would agree that there needs to be, you know, but these, but it's always different. You, you never know. Nietzsche was a professor at 24, so was Schelling. Uh, Nietzsche then decided <laughs> to to become a, to become a heavy, heavy metal, uh, uh, he wrote a heavy metal record, you know, uh, The Birth of Tragedy. 
he be, he became yeah, he like screw I, linguistics and philology i'm gonna jump in the well even though it, it's he's he's heavy on the philo uh, philology but then he's more like you know yeah, eventually this yeah. that i want to do philosophy yeah and and it's so the idea is also of course to have young people who are who are, or at basically any age group i don't know what it's like at, at your institution but we have in one classroom the youngest one now currently is 16. whoa uh and he's going through he did my he attended my baudrillard seminar and he's now in the hegel course and the oldest one in the Hegel course is somewhere around 50. Now, in my Heidegger course, I think the youngest one was 23, and the oldest one somewhere around 70. And in between that, every age group, people from in many Americans often, Europeans, German speakers, English speakers, Italians, um, French people, etc. So we've there's all kinds of languages, etc., coming together and different ways of seeing and understanding the world. And at the same time, also, I think what there's more of a, a guidance than perhaps <clears throat> in inside academia. I remember one course at some university, doesn't matter, that I may or may not have been affiliated with. The, the title of the course was Philosophy of the Art of Living. And I remember students asking me at some point, why is this course called the Philosophy of the Art of Living? We've, why, why are we discussing De Descartes dualism what is this is, you know and even and, and even you know and even Descartes you could you could make it more relevant or appealing to young people uh and and also all the weirdness that comes with philosophy is also crowded out inside academia but that's a different story so back to what I wanted to say we can provide and I think that we do and guidance to to those who are seeking um knowledge and, and wisdom and philosophy and guidance in a sense that they can especially when they're young uh younger so that you know they get to within certain uh within a certain range or, or yeah with with limits of course but you can actually support someone and guide someone who's talented uh, without them perhaps uh, getting completely uh, just and obviously, you know, just uh, turned into a cog in the wheel of the machinery of, of, of academia. Of course, that has, as you may have alluded to, I don't know, uh, has its, there are perils when you um, give someone something too quickly. So that that's always a balancing act. That's but clear. this is this is this is why perhaps like focusing like they need to get their uh kind of priorities straight and i do understand they mm, like well, mm. it's not the same great research is is important right uh, if you're doing physics not if you're doing philosophy like research you know and the and the, you go to the lab and you do research and you have to produce data right? this is like you have to come up with data and do your all sorts of research stuff to come up with new hypotheses or test hypotheses that are ongoing and come up with a new theory and blah 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 right so if if you're young you do a phd in physics fine that's this is how you do stuff in physics mm. but when it comes to the humanities philosophy particularly and and maybe uh fine well arts in general sociology is probably different because of the way things are are done there like in philosophy up to a certain point you're not gathering you're not putting together data and doing you know empirical research yeah. so perhaps if they but even for me even in physics or any any academic uh field like maybe yeah. they can establish some sort of structure or a program such that okay you get your phd but then if we hire you the first five years you need to uh, apprentice into the art of teaching because this is not something easy that like i when i first started teaching of course i i was 24 also i gave my first course you learn a lot by actually, even if you did 
GA before, it's not the same because now this is your course, you're yeah. responsible, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe five years to do that, then you incorporate this, you have a sense of where you are, how you teach, uh, make the subject relatable to the students. And then afterwards, you can move on to apprenticeship and research, which I know you have to do when you're doing PhD, but then it's not the same. You have to learn how to, it's it's different when you're at university, it's different. So I don't know, I'm, I'm just thinking of ways of, because what you're mentioning is is true. Like, yeah, you have to get opportunities at 24, uh, but then bit by bit, learn this through apprenticeship, how to yeah. do things, yeah. how to teach, how to do research, how to even network. All the, they don't come like at, at one point, you're just thrown out into the world a la Heidegger, and then you have to figure things out. And the way things are, no one, no one wants to help you because everyone is fending for themselves. They're inside trying to, a, in, in inside academia. academia, of course. And this is the, the mind boggling thing because in, on social media and in, in this world, everyone is helping each other out. Yes. That's, that's, <laughs> it's, was, it's like, that's the funny is, thing, except there, there are a few people who don't. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Like, and, I'm, and but but we, understandable. We, but then they're we, also upfront. They don't tell you. Maybe if you do this, I'm gonna help you. They're just, you know. I, they, and then ten years later, after waiting for that, I will help you. They'll, they no. At least here, they're they're yeah, upfront yeah. and they're like, you know what? I'm not. I'm not interested. So, which is good. Yeah, like, yeah. I I appreciate your transparency and honesty. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's striking. I mean, I mean, some over the years I've seen of you who have tried to to basically become the monopoly offerers of, of online courses, which uh, is, if you know anything about the internet, is completely impossible. And many have failed, by the way, even academies, like they're, they're gone. Oh, yeah, they, they, yeah. they should go. I mean, they, they, yeah. Because yeah. this is not in the spirit. I mean, this is so this is the funny thing. Mahmoud and I are by from the outside competitors. Right, we could think that, well, I shouldn't like anything that uh, Mahmoud puts out on his course on philosophy of the, of science, which is something we don't offer, but that's what people really like. If I like this, then maybe someone who follows me and he will go to his courses and maybe not come back. That's the that's that's literally what happens inside. This is also something I noticed about people inside academia is that they. they it becomes almost paranoid that you you don't discuss certain ideas you don't say everything because you you're scared that someone might uh take away this is so these some of these seminars become really sterile and it, and i was always attracted also to the people who had also basically already left internally um when they were when they were in academia even and even now, the the people that so I went to this conference in Tübingen, the the gentleman who organized this doesn't even have a doctorate. He worked in the administration of Tübingen University, and uh, but it was always he. So for in his, his entire, he's now retiring. His entire life, he's been teaching, and he's he's built his own uh, publishing house where he publishes uh, his friends and 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 others uh, in German philosophy, most broadly speaking. Heideggerian phenomenology. Um, he he found someone, a, a private donor, to fund his three Heidegger conferences. I've there's nowhere else that I learned more about Heidegger's thinking than at these three conferences. Someone who doesn't care. Ivo De Cinaro in in Italy has a position and he's a very good teacher, but he also has had for many years with friends uh, a website where they publish their own articles. Um, so they did that started doing this decade almost 20 years ago i think um yeah but on and this is on the margin because it, it kind of reminds me a lot about how things were done back in the day as well adam smith or oh, and 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 people before like you know uh the schlegel uh, even Schelling and all these people they were paid by how many students they had like you needed to have so even though they were affiliated with universities you had to have students sign up for your course to be paid you know, so it was it was kind of they had to get stu like so it wasn't you know like how things are now you even though now they can close courses etc but it was and, pretty yeah. much like it it was very different back in the day so 
and they all started their not all up to a certain point they would start their yeah. own public you know editorials publishing houses etc look for funding besides the university as well so it's yeah like so, this is it it's always striking me as something that's been almost the norm but then somehow well, what's also been the norm is that philosophers are outside the academy rené yeah. rené descartes is outside the academy so is uh, leibniz true, uh, true. um fichte was fired uh <laughs> hegel for some time was an editor yeah uh, of a newspaper and and kant i don't know if he had like i think kant got his first uh offer at 40 or something much i think at 50 so but yeah. the kantians will scream in agony because it's wrong both of these numbers but he was he was past 40 maybe not quite 50 when he was finally received his chair he was a, a house lehrer he was a private tutor tutor before. exactly uh nietzsche left academia because he was <clears throat> dying from it. Um, yeah, but this is the thing. It's like things that have been normal, not only 30, 40 years ago, but way before. But now they the look way, at you and they're like, oh, you're, you're, you don't want to be in academia. And it's, it's, as though it's weird. It's like, man, this is how things have been forever. I think, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think that's already changing. I, you know, um, st students, the young ones, especially they, they honestly, they don't care if some, I mean, they don't really care if you're a professor somewhere. What they really care about is whether you've got anything to say. Uh, and they, they, they're on YouTube. I mean, uh, that's where they are. But also because of what you were saying with Adam Smith and uh, etc., uh, that reminded me of something that I didn't mention before that I had forgotten. Um, one of the things that maybe people are not aware of is that especially in America, but this is already starting in continental Europe as well, is when you apply for a position, it doesn't just matter how many publications you have and in the background which network you have, which is never published. Uh, but it has a, but also you will you will have you will on on your CV you will have to mention how much you're worth. It's the most bizarre thing you can find uh, publicly. You can find CVs published by big names in philosophy where they detail precisely how much money they've gotten from which funding body. Mm. So. You know, I get you get fifteen thousand pounds per year for us. That's when I was a PhD student at least. It was fifteen thousand pounds, so that's forty five thousand pounds for three years. For three and a half, it was about fifty thousand pounds. So you have to put that on your CV, and then any travel bursary you get. All of this you need to have on your CV. Look at American CVs. That's how they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hundred thousand yeah, yeah. dollars here. You have big names. You know, German philosophers. I won't mention any names who, who you can find. The EU gave me $60,000 in this, and here I got another $100,000 in this. And then you understand also, you know, why some people drive bigger cars than others. Um, but uh, the, there's, there's always embezzlement in academia too, right? Which, by the way, obviously comes when you have people who, who don't make any money until they're 45 or 50. And then finally they get to sit on a chair. That means in Germany they've got power. Oh, come back to Palpatine. Unlimited power. They really have unlimited power. They have they are they are, they are powerful beyond anything. Another reason to go to the UK to do a PhD is that in the UK, your supervisor has to see you, and they have to make sure that when you submit, the viva takes place within a reasonable amount of time. In Germany, what can happen to you is that you submit. And after two years, you don't, you haven't even heard from your PhD supervisor, your so-called doctor father, your doctorate father, father. So, you know, um, many reasons to go to the UK. I just mentioned this here for anyone still thinking about doing a PhD in Germany. Not that there's any philosophy still being done in Germany. That's in any way relevant to anyone. Ouch. Um, don't no, you but want it's... Me? I, I want to bring up a name. Let's see how where this is going to... Let's. No, no, no names. No, no. Who? Who? Someone famous within... Well, you know, the, the famous ones are usually... Ted Talks and stuff. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. You can find his CVs uh, online with... with, with um you know, lists of, of money. So uh, that's which, which, uh, which, uh, which bond to be so, specific. <laughs> he, he may have worked on Shelley. So he, the, exactly. Yeah. So the, the issue that 
that, that you reminded me of here is that really you are dealing again on this level also with a kind of a, a, a strange kind of a business where your value is really established, you really is established by money in monetary terms and financial, terms. how much money you've been able to raise. That's your worth. That's how much you are worth. That's to me is a perversion of the, the humanities philosophy and also the hard sciences, because that, you know, leads to all kinds of capture and corruption, obviously, right. If, if you're dependent upon funding from Microsoft or Google or meta, uh, to write their new AI ethics uh, uh, protocol, etc. I mean, th that to me, it's all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of issues. The good thing is we're we're in the second hour, so no one's listening anymore. So it's basically just you and I talking. But... Uh, uh, believe me, even if one or two they they listen to, <laughs> to the entire thing, good. especially if it's philosophy. But yeah. So but... so the, but you you wanted to say something. I... No, 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 I, no, no, I don't want to mention, no, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, but you're like absolutely, absolutely right. But this is, this is, see, this is the thing. This is why I don't know why, uh, because I, you, I don't know if you, you get that in my case, not that it bothers me, honestly, but then what do you get? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it because it's, I always do this comparison, right? But it, it looks like we're talking here institutional funding versus people actually paying directly like the people who start calling you you know a social media employee a grifter uh, whatever yeah see this is it's like i it's and i'm like yeah sure i'm i'm a sophist i i i need to live this is this is i felt honestly personally i felt more of a grifter at university than uh, doing this now because at least at university they're almost obliged to take your courses right then you're not not necessarily your course but then you know they have to take intro to philosophy to, to fulfill a humanities requirement it fee personally it feels more of grifting there because you're obliging them and in the social media space and the digital space people sign up because they want to yes and also it might come as a surprise to people, but you know, you and I have to eat. Uh, <laughs> I know that you like sleeping under bridges. Yeah. And I um, eat Lebanon sardines. That's well, true, by the way. I, I, I don't dwell really under a bridge, but I do eat Lebanon sardines. <laughs> so it's, and, and, and I look, psychiatrists um, charge per hour. Uh, an artist is allowed to sell his or her painting. Uh, a novelist is allowed to um, to sell their books. So is a poet. And why shouldn't an institution like yours or mine, a, a school of philosophy, be allowed to judge? an amount that allows that school to persist and grow and provide something that is, a, I would say, a need. It is Philosophy is a human need, like food and shelter. Uh, we, you know, it's not just um, entertainment. People come to your courses because they, for some, you know, it's not just, oh, I want to read Sartre because Sartre is a big name, because Sartre expresses something of the human condition that even though, of course, I have to disagree with Sartre in many things, or many things but Sartre expresses something, because I know you've, you've taught on existentialism. Uh, the existentialists express something, have articulated something, what it means to be human in a post-Christian time. Um, and hence... They address something that's fundamental about who we are as we try to articulate who we are. Now, I don't the, the I think if if the if the motivation is to make money, that's when it becomes sophistry. By the way, I think there's more sophistry inside academia for all the reasons that um, you and I have mentioned. Uh and <clears throat> Also, because again, there's no certificate, so there's no external val validation of these courses. There's there's literally just once 
the strange thing that happens is this. Yeah, obviously, I sell a course like you do too. I, I go on Instagram. I go on Twitter. I go on YouTube. But it's not, I, I don't have any paid ads. I don't promise anything. Like I never I never say, you will walk away from this course having understood Heidegger. I, ba I basically say, you will come in, you'll probably go away co more confused than you came in. Um, you, uh, there's a dislodging that happens. And that's when my job is done. You know, we walk away kind of completely confused or maybe uh, on a different sphere, but we can't really put it in, into words. And that's something that happens in these seminars that has never happened when I taught at university. You know, here's a story I always tell. The first course I ever taught or seminar as a TA at Warwick was in Greek philosophy. And Greek philosophy is dear to my heart. It's after all, it's the beginning. First seminar, first year students, first semester so these people are at university a day right they come in and i say nothing on purpose for about four or five minutes i say nothing i just look at them and they get very nervous i've never seen people so nervous you know phone and everything I always... then i say why are you here why are you here and the response I got from one of these young fellow travelers was, uh, is this relevant for the exam? By which, of course, this young bloke meant to say, to tell me, come on now, this is five minutes wasted. You need to get to the material so that we can know what to learn by rote, not by heart, but by rote, so that we can regurgitate it um, I've heard, by the way, recently from someone in Italy that they're now offering uh, multiple choice tests because they have so many students. Well, you know, and at some point, ChatGPT will just do the, chat, the, the multiple choice questions for you, and then they will have ChatGPT answering the, the multiple choice questions. So why, why even go to university? You basically just pay. You, if you pay, you pay. They, they you, put up the, you pretend they, that you work. They pretend that they pay you as more. Yes, yes, I don't even know if that's something he said allegedly. So, yeah. So exactly. So we've got we've got this really bizarre situation where um, there is inside. Uh, so in 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 in, a, in institutions in Germany, I would think, and I've seen those from the inside too. There can be great seminars. There can be great seminars everywhere. There are great seminars in, in at British universities, obviously, right? There are wonderful teachers, but now generalizing a bit. And that's maybe a bit unfair, but still, I think within Germany, the incentive is to become a professor and have the title and have the standing and the privilege and the status that comes with it, right? So you've got that as an incentive. That the same incentive you have in British universities, but in British universities, you also have on top of it students sitting in front of you who are there, who are going into debt to study philosophy. So the the strange thing is that that that, that never leaves that that tension of you know, of course some are wealthy they don't have to worry about money but most aren't so they really need to get to it <laughs> and there will be others i mean i had great students too i had an italian student once after 10 weeks of uh heidegger lectures with miguel in a few seminars uh, i was a ta for that course back then he said oh it's changed my entire thinking I, I used to think that we are just economic units because that's how I was brought up. But now I'm, I realize we're always with others and that I, isolation is only possible because of this being with others, uh, et cetera. So it's, it can change and there's still good work being done inside academia. But overall, sorry, it takes me long to get to the point. Overall, once the selling for my courses, the offering, I mean, basically I'm not selling, I'm offering a course and people are free to join as they are in your school. Once they're inside, none of this matters. They come in, they're excited, and everything else is forgotten. It's completely enclosed. It's something that they do for themselves, that do to themselves, perhaps also, uh, on the weekend, in my case. Um, and that's it. They, they come purely for that. They don't come for... There's no... I mean, maybe there's a little bit of recognition when you get, you know, published on on my youtube channel where you get what two clicks <laughs> so i mean so there, there there is that of course also uh so there is record but recognition is not there's nothing wrong with recognition 
um but they come purely for this and there's there's no other cons there's no such market constraint inside the seminar yeah All right yeah this is see this is this is what i also think to myself it's like i'm 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 not forcing anyone to sign up for my courses because just yesterday someone posted uh, someone who follows me so it's not someone who's you know these random trolls someone who's been following me for several i don't know how many months maybe years also a, he was like you're prostituting philosophy it's because i'm because of the read philosophy they think i'm i'm promoting my courses through the read philosophy tweets i don't know if you've seen them but the read philosophy tweets i think just, they're brilliant some of them are really brilliant I, and it's just I, a joke like it's, I'm, if i really wanted to promote my courses no. i say philosophy is useless i don't say read philosophy so. no but 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 philosophy is useless that's the beauty of it of we course need of more course. uselessness you see yeah. what, what we're doing is we're we're we're, we're, we're twisting the whole uh, everything. Philosophy is useless. There's nothing. It, and I think one of one of your I remember that one. It was it. Uh, I, what was it? Read philosophy. Then I got now I don't know whether there's I an used external to be angry, world. So yeah, I, I, used read, yeah. I, I used to be angry. So I decided to read philosophy, and then I'm like, you know, all these. Now I'm even more every, confused. Every every now and then I I have like n now the latest series is what so I'm before that I've been doing for philosophers by bi Twitter bios and now what would a philosopher uh, how would they write a Twitter thread so uh, following these thread boys you know 21 things you need to do to, <laughs> in order to you know kickstart your career and stuff like that but then I so yeah, every now and then I have like this whatever series I don't even know how uh, I, I come up with them but yeah before that it's I used to be angry so I decided to read philosophy then I got more confused and I have like several tweets about those yeah, every time I, I I change something but yes so what do you res <laughs> what did you respond though I interrupted you I'm um, sorry what did you respond to this person no no nothing it's this is uh, I, I told him like yeah great I'm like I'm I'm happy to do that it's see a, a few a few years ago I would have felt bad about this someone calling me you know like you're prostituting philosophy or anything of the sort nowadays I'm just like I honestly genuinely in hindsight feel like I was a grifter when I was at university honestly like I'm not even joking and it's not because of like it, I'm a it grifter feels, it's dishonest it, it feels dishonest it, yes on like seriously because it's because the entire and this is I don't know if this is the American system at least it's it's probably mm. different than in, in the UK and Europe because here you only people who are majoring in philosophy get to take philosophy courses the entire thought process is, of course, they call them liberal arts curriculums and stuff like that. But then deep down, what you're really trying to do is think about ways to force students to take courses. Like this is yeah. why many, yep. many, many uh, humanities professors would give easy A's just yes. to get more students. And this is how it was. Yeah, or to, and yes, or to get, I mean, I remember distinctly someone who's now become over the past decade uh, and he was you know he was priming for this extreme careerist at king's college london he he was teaching he still is there he was teaching aesthetics so i've given a lot away already but i remember his seminars um which were cuddle muddle you know they were just really nilly anything goes i remember because he was he was he just he just he just got in so he had a, a, a lectureship and your career depends not only, but also upon evaluations. I don't think it's actually, I don't really know whether they're actually that important, but at least there's a fear of them. And I remember this, this young professor lecturer just approving, just go, uh, anything. You know, there, there was one girl in there who shouldn't have been at university. She just kept saying, everything is art. I, I just think everything is art. And, every, and I think everything is good art. And this was, this was her contribution to Hegel. And he, he just kept saying, yeah, great, really great stuff. Uh -huh, great. Yeah, great. And so, yeah, Hegel just says thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So, like, 
that's just basically Hegel. It was such a bizarre seminar. I thought, what, this is King's College. I mean, there were much better people. There were others who were very different. Uh, but this was someone who was young, fearful of the of of the evaluation. So anything, and I was actually, I, I remember getting to say, it's, after three or four weeks, I said, no, not everything is art. You know, the, 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 the trash can outside is not art. Uh, and, and even, like, even, you know, Dujamp, et cetera, uh, is not, I would say high art for many reasons. And she had, there was for her, there was no difference between a Harry Potter novel and Goethe's Faust because they're both books and maybe even, uh, Harry Potter is better because more people read it. Um, so it was just sheer relativism that didn't even have anything interesting to say either but and so everyone basically also leaves at this point now with with an average mark so not a's that would be too much uh but it, it's everyone goes leaves university now with a, what they call a 2-1 or a 2-2 which is either a b plus or a b minus or a b ish 2-1 2-2 it's it's the what do they call it the Bell's curve yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also uh, the, the reason, the reason why I left, I got, yeah. uh, I left, uh, one of the universities, LEU it's, it's all on, on Twitter. Well documented is because, uh, one week into the course, you know, in U S, uh, system, you have an add and drop period. And so the first session I tell, I had, I had two courses, one existentialism and literature and one freshman philosophy. Yeah. I tell freshman students, uh, this is not an easy a course. Like you, if you want a good grade, you need to study for this course. Like you don't expect that you you come in here because you want to increase your GPA. <laughs> so the chairperson two days later calls me and he's like, what have you done? You're threatening students. They complained ah, to the dean, and I told ridiculous. him, "What do you mean? They, th I threatened students. Did I have a gun at you? Know, like, did I bring <laughs> a gun? <laughs> Honestly, like seriously, it's like, uh, w what's this about? They have to study hard, and and I'm I'm see like it's it's all there, 2019, 20. I th I forgot even, but it's all there with the emails and everything." And he's like, uh, at, at LU, we don't threaten students. And yeah, it's like wires crossed in my brain. And I told him, look, this is it. Like you're, uh, this is where I draw the line. You telling me how to run my classes. Yeah. Uh, I'm out and. I walked out, but before I left, I, uh, I was actually shouting, like everyone heard <laughs> what I was saying. Like I was actually shouting, no insults, nothing that is insulting or improper. But I was just, this is where I draw the line. You are not going to be telling me how to teach my courses. I quit. And so 15 minutes later, he's like, I've spoken with the Dean and we agreed like that. Yeah, no, we're, we don't want your services anymore. So yeah. That was quick then. That was, uh, if the, of course, because it's like, this is what you're talking about. It's like, at one point, if I really, if I re that also on the side, and I don't really mind mention, uh, mentioning them at, uh, because you're, you're talking about fearing, you know, the consequences and uh, whatever. I've, I've caught students plagiarizing. Yeah. And instead of, you know, taking the proper, like, I, I'm not even saying Dean's warning. It's just like, okay, so how are we going to, to work things uh, out? You, you usually report it to the chairperson and the very same chairperson would be like, let's fix it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and another ex student of mine, who's now teaching at that institution sent yeah. me a message a few m weeks ago. He's like, how did you actually manage to teach there? Because there are two students that I failed and they don't want them to fail. I can send you the screenshot like yeah, afterwards. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, 
it's you know like i don't i don't think it's it's as bad elsewhere no uh, but well you know so in, talk in, about in grifting right like this is for me grifting <laughs> in, in america what i hear this this is even from very good institutions students can very easily get an, a request and actually get an extension on just about anything i think it's going that way in britain i know for a fact though that in cambridge there are people in the philosophy and in the um, theology let's just say department who are extremely strict still and because you know it's still cambridge and it's still oxford so they they won't um they, they won't just let you get an extension even if just just for a couple of days i mean it, you know no you won't get that uh and it should be it, so and I, I i've never had those issues what i what i've been told is make that's one of the moments when I, I knew very early on when I was a TA, some professor at Warwick who was teaching Kant, he's no longer there, so I can say this. Doesn't matter his name. Uh, he, he said to me that the, the seminar was too difficult. I shouldn't get into the, the word transcendental, it shouldn't be discussed, it confuses the students. And I actually discussed uh, Kant as I do also in my German idealism course, uh, which is one of the most difficult ones. Um, I discuss Kant in terms of the transcendental logic and not some, you know, benign epistemology. So I wasn't supposed to do this because it's too difficult. And I was told, make the customer happy. That's a quote, make the customer happy. So another, you know, another reason to leave. Some other time, some, someone, someone else told me that I, that I should do chit chat at the beginning. So in, in my evaluation, you know, I wanted to know how to teach well. So I was told do chit chat. I was, this is 2016 or 17. He said to me, you should discuss stranger things. And I said, what kind of stranger things? I don't know what you're talking about. And he told me it's a Netflix show. And I'm so old fashioned at the time. I didn't even know what Netflix was. So now I know, but I was supposed, I was supposed to talk about a show on Netflix in the beginning before I teach them Hume. That's so why even go to university? You know, one of the one, one professor, so he allowed me to quote him on this, Ken Cheems. Um, Ken Cheems said to me in February when we went to a pub, he said to me, the university is one issue. They will con increasingly optimize for bureaucratic types. He's a Nietzschean, you can hear that. And they will crowd out any creative types. So they, they will not be going to university in the future, he thinks. Because the, the what they will attract is bureaucrats. And, and, and I don't just mean bureaucrats and bureaucratic types in the administration, but bureaucratic students, people who just, you know, do the job and do, do as told and make the customer happy. And so it will continue forevermore. Um, but it won't be... Um, you will not grow as a human being. You won't be challenged. You won't have a professor who professes publicly to something and then challenges you to defend what you had to say. Again, places like Cambridge and Oxford will be will be different, I think, uh, in some some areas at least. But other liberal arts colleges are going that way, and they're hence making themselves obsolete because they do want to make the customer happy. See, but this is. Like I, I agree with the sentiment, but I also see uh, the other side of things. And this is, I'll, I'll tell you my approach. Like it's not the same thing to teach freshman philosophy than to teach intro to philosophy than to teach uh, aesthetics. Because I've taught like existentialism, existentialism in literature, intro to, so personally, I adapt as a function of the course I'm giving. So for example, if I'm teaching now a philosophy for professionals course or an intro to philosophy or an existentialism yeah. course, it's not the same as if I'm teaching philosophy of art. Because if I have freshman students there, I also don't want to scare them away from what philosophy is because they like they're not they're not majoring in philosophy, right? So in this case, I do kind of take it 
Yeah, you hit, yeah, of course. But that, that's, that's, you know? that's not so, what I mean. But this is saying, like, yeah, I, yeah. I would discuss Stranger Things with them in, in an intro. To the, but this is this is well, important. Like, okay, it's, it's good that you... you bring this up. But, but this is where <laughs> I would say, like, it's not the same. For example, if you join the philosophy of science courses that we, we teach, it's not the yeah. same as, or analytic philosophy or whatever. It's not the same as the intro. But because expectations are also different. For yeah. You. So I I would say like context and and the kind of course that you're teaching, or the kind of subject that you're teaching, also is is important when it comes to how you yeah, of course approach yeah. But but there's a difference between um uh between being told to 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 dis to just do how did you like this new episode of stranger things yeah yeah no, or yeah. looking at stranger things in terms of well the the obvious lovecraftian elements in there uh and yeah um you know not the, not like the chit chat kind yeah. things <laughs> things like mind mind control um and and other really weird and terrible things frankly that this show is about um so yeah that that that's different and obviously the language always changes when you teach so that's why i asked why are you here why are you here is a question usually that opens someone up to to say that for example f f f and and i had students like this in at Birkbeck then they were much different um Birkbeck attracts a different type of student still because many of them already work they just go to university they go back to university or maybe do their first degree when they're already working. Um, they were much more open. They had much better discussions there, but the more streamlined, the more important um, uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, universities or so that more important in terms of the ranking, they, they may be um, more open. They may just attract a different kind of, student i suppose so yes obviously the language changes and i'm not just jumping in and so you know this is why plato's theory of forms is is not even a thing because of the parmenides dialogue blah, blah, and this is the first seminar no you begin of course that's i, I agree with this completely um and though but the way in which i perceive this though is that there must be this is this to be i think a certain uh I don't know seriousness about um, uh, teaching that you know you take someone seriously instead of trying to meet them. You know you're not you're not trying to be their buddy. I'm not trying yeah. to be your. You know I'm I'm 19. I'm you know I'm just as hip as you are. Here's what what I watch. If on we're Netflix. talking university, then um, then I completely agree. It's uh like you know if, if we're talking you, within a university context can you hear me did i cut yes out? yeah yeah now now you I, I think i was unstable okay uh when when we're talking if, if we're talking back, in yeah. a university context i completely agree <clears throat> uh, okay but also there's a difference between the university context and and the kind of people that sign up for for personally my courses now so i the because you were mentioning you have uh, a 16 year old signing up for your classes. In my case, the youngest so far has been like, they're 25 years old, but then the oldest. So it's a, it's yeah. a different kind of demographic and different kind of uh, people. But yes, if, if we're talking university, like you're trying to be hip because you want to blend in, etc. Yeah, that's a different, a completely different story. So I agree with you there. Yeah. But but even but even outside you you know you you have to take the people who come you have to take them seriously definitely and yeah and taking them seriously um, means also that you that you you keep a certain you keep a certain um, I hope I'm not breaking up uh, you keep a certain professional distance also. Um, and taking them seriously means that you actually do challenge what they say and uh, let them try and rephrase what they say and defend what they are trying to argue for. Uh, if if not, then everyone is a B minus. And they so 
so in the you you were told not to threaten students um if that i was threat. never told that <laughs> Yeah, if if that's even considered a threat, it's like telling them you have to study to get a good grade. I don't know if you're. I say, think sorry, say that again. It was breaking up a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm saying it's in so far as a threat is called like telling them to they have to study hard is is a threat is understood as a threat. To get good grades yeah so so that's that's really bizarre um and that that there was this would be this that this would be perceived as um a, a threat i mean that, that's that's what a classroom is is for is to to tell people that this is not easy uh and and even the beginning is not easy but what in the beginning you you what what I think a good teacher in philosophy has to do is to show students um, that there's something at stake in philosophy, that it isn't just um, some theory or so, but that articulate and also we try to understand uh, you're breaking. So out. obviously what is at stake is. Now you're back. So am I. Yeah, you're back now. As, let's just see. Is your. Um, maybe if you can turn off your video as well, then we know who's breaking up. Uh, I'm good. So it's been good so far. Because the strange thing is that you, you just say you, so we had a bit of a technical issue, but you were, you were saying in between the break that we're not complaining. Uh, and I would also say it's not grifting. I just tell you a story. I was in 2019. I went to the Lake district, which is in the North of England. And I was on my own. I hiked around, uh, Lake bottom. Yeah for example, which is one of the lakes that Turner painted. Uh, it's also where Withland and I is set, the, one of the greatest English films ever made. If you don't know it, you have to see it with Richard Grant. And um, anyway, I, I wrote something back then, which I have never published, which was on philosophy and patronage. Because I was uh, thinking, I was thinking through this also, because as you know, you, you grew up with the the specter of the sophists. But I think the sophists, the issue is not so much they they charge. The issue is how they teach and and what they teach. Um, and that's, I think, uh, more the issue. I would also think that Aristotle, when he was Alexander's teacher, I would presume that um, he at least received board. So he will not have done this for free. And uh, I, I, I will leave it at that for now. I think you wanted to say th something on com com complaining or rather our not complaining, but diagnosing yeah. the situation. No, it's uh, but see, yeah, this is this is a thing like we uh, if if anyone is is listening s thus far, I mean, because I've I've spoken about this before, but this is it's it's very rare that I come across people who have experienced a similar kind of or or who have been through a similar kind of experience in yeah. in academia, and I will insist on our our two different approaches because I like I try to avoid like I don't see I never went into philosophy to become a scholar, and this is this is why I think it's. It's curious these these two cases, yours and mine, because I see you as doing hardcore philosophy, like actual philosophy. In my case, I get others to do the hardcore stuff. <laughs> I, 
uh, like you know Islamic philosophy, philosophy of science, uh, philosophy and language. I have Colin Gori, uh, Philippe Caponis, uh, Hani Hassan, and you know, so so these people do do the stuff. I I I found it more. Uh, I find myself just like Brian McGee, probably even Brian McGee was, was much better than myself. But like, I see myself as a popularizer you, you, of, of you, philosophy. If you learned a bit of a British accent, you, you'd be a master in understatement. <laughs> yeah, but so, but, but, so it's uh, the long, long story short, like all this is talking about academia is because we've we're already this is what we were discussing we are outside academia right and uh, it's it's not that i have a problem with academia as such it's just that we're trying to yeah. diagnose the problems uh, that yeah. academia is experiencing and unlike uh, like i i don't think you can solve these problems from within academia from within the system that's it so, but, yeah, yeah. but it's, I think it's important to try to diagnose where the problem is like, you know, because we talked about the inefficiency of the market. We talked about, uh, putting, uh, evaluation and all sorts of mecha mechanisms to, you know, at least try to balance things out because you have so many people, uh, with PhDs, very little vacancies, but then ultimately the market is changing. Things are changing 30 years ago. Things were different. This is why they rely heavily on publishing etc just to give academia the benefit of the doubt yeah and as you were saying funding has become also important uh yep. and everyone on on their cv now include having how how much they they got from from different projects etc so it's it's kind of weird because the very same people who feel like they're seeking truth and searching for truth are also the same people who depend by and large on on finding new funding because they're playing the game right so it's i don't see us as complaining as yeah. much as trying to genuinely understand why things have shifted but at the same time you would ask me am i interested in in getting an, a, a, a full-time position in academia I, th I would tell you honestly no what i would do from here onwards is perhaps and we can we can end on this note like if if i would only teach on an adjunct basis so for example if i can teach one course two courses uh, i would be affiliated with the university because i love teaching but yeah. other than that like i'm not interested in all this academia game so yeah. maybe to end on a positive note how would you uh do things well, in your case well, I, I I will continue as 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 I've been doing it. Will, it will, there will be more uh, structures in place, and I'm quite interested in the cursus honorum of the uh, Roman military, the Roman army. Uh, that that could be a way, you know, um, to to find a structure uh, for how people rise within. Uh, the ranks in an organization, but there's also always an element of steering a ship, Kubernetes, uh, right? Cybernetics, after after all, comes from being a steerman. So in the digital sphere, it's always very liquid. So uh, virtues like uh, loyalty, honesty, etc., they're very important. Um, so, um, just in organizational terms, what I can foresee though and this is to a certain degree already happening is <clears throat> that there will be new so it could be that someone like you or so is is invited by a university um to teach courses because they know that this will attract students and you have a proven track record outside academia of being a good teacher um, in your own institutions, so that could happen. That they will actually, to remain relevant, will open again. Will will actually offer, um, you know, as as British universities do already, they they give visiting fellowships or professorships to big names, like they do with they did with Roger Scruton or Shizek, uh, who never actually even shows uh, you know up at some of the institutions or even doesn't really teach much or not at all um so that i can actually um 
foresee and it may also within academia of course then at some point lead to so the, the colleges in in england th those are an example in the 19th century when oxford and cambridge had become very elitist but also didn't serve the the wider public anymore at all we were basically just in competition with each other that gave that that gave th that that's why Birkbeck College was founded. That's why King's College was founded. That's, I think, uh, 18th already. So there must have been a time, 18th, 19th century, when Oxford and Cambridge no longer really served the public good, which led to the founding of UCL, KCL, and ultimately also Birkbeck and a few others, a few other colleges. So that, that I think, could be happening now, um, which is also why people who only have YouTube channels and not even any, you know, significant... Um, degree now get invited to give talks um uh jonathan peugeot for example recently gave a talk in london inv invited by professors of came uh, who are people who are you know teach philosophy and religion in cambridge so that that's happening uh, and i can see that that this is something that could um arise also because People like you and me who are outside, who are experimenting with the digital in, in a way that we're not consumers of the digital, but uh, creators with it. We're not just, we're not consuming, uh, we're not just consuming content. Um, <clears throat> the something, by the way, when I was at Birkbeck, what they did during the lockdowns, they actually, when they didn't offer any in-person in classes, Birkbeck actually, they actually posted YouTube videos behind their paywall, right? So I don't, I'm not aware that any of the creators were paid for this or made aware of it, but those links, so there were links posted to videos on YouTube by creators. And I'm pretty sure that other universities did this also, because um, that's where the kids are anyways. That's where the, that's where they are. I mean, you know, it's, I can, when I walk around the university, the colleges in London, Sometimes they walk up to me and and, and ask me for a, a, an autograph, which I never give because it's bizarre. Um, obviously, young philosophy student students or so they 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 watch videos by me, uh, and so that's kind of the weird uh, side of this. But that's where young people are, and we're able to deal, I think, or address the digital and and experiment with it that maybe older institutions aren't yet where they just use it to to streamline or make worse some of their internal processes that are already in place whereas we're building this from the ground up on the digital so it's being built up completely in a completely different way uh from the beginning and that's that's a major difference so the way i see this going is um we'll we'll be you know building up i see by the end of this decade we know where we are i think that this decade will be uh, decisive for for anything in this regard um <clears throat> but it may very well be that it actually leads to a slight uh change inside the institutions and outside there will be a greater awareness of an appreciation of this this way of of learning um and a way for people to as i said before to find the others and connect with others and in their common search so yeah a lot of uh opportunities for probably academia and people like us who are doing things outside of it uh, adapt uh, the digital age without the fuss you know it's not it's it's not the hype and oh you have to do this or do that but then things change and it's like thing yeah. where things are changing and so they they have think, to just adapt yeah. one way or or the other I, th I think the reason why you and i are doing well is because we're at least as far as i can tell what i see from you is that we're not following any of the hypes uh, we're exactly. basically just offering what it is that you said before. I'd like, I'd be an air chunk because I want, because you love to teach. So do I. So it's a necessity for me. It's a need. I have to teach. Uh, and I, and I want to get P 
people to meet each other. I also read every day. Uh, sometimes I tell myself I'm not going to read, and then here I am again, you know, with good old Schelling and who else, whoever else. Uh, <clears throat> so this is why there's, there's, there's no hype. We don't f follow any of what it is that you supposedly have to do. We, we use the tools that we find the most intuitive to use, not because anyone told us to. We use Gumroad, I use Teachable because it was the first, it's easy enough for me. I just need to upload something and it's, it looks good enough. Uh, I can have other people teach for me and it's a very easy thing to set them up as authors, etc. cetera. Uh, I use Zoom because it's I understand it. Um, there's not much to understand. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I've so I've someone recently asked me actually if I have a business mentor or, or if I've done what kind of paid ads and this that and the other a sales funnel I don't even know what a sale I still don't know what a sales funnel is uh, I don't know any of these marketing terms um, what I do is I offer I we put together I think really great syllabi course study guides. Uh, that people can download and even if they don't take the course, they have something in their hand. They've got a reading list, etc., and quotes and uh, an idea of where to start on Hegel or whoever else. Um, sometimes I don't even have that. I just have a, a landing page. I've never, uh, ever, uh, I have no idea how to write a landing page. I don't have an FAQ on my landing pages because... I sometimes I send out FAQ emails when people actually ask me questions or people ask me questions on YouTube. So I have no idea how to write a landing page, how to do this properly. It's basically because I think once you start doing this, it becomes contrived and fakery. So I, I don't do it. I, it just comes out as it comes out. Um, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to read. This is when we meet. This is what you get. Basta enough yeah yeah this is i think this is this is also important like of course eventually uh people need to hear about you one way or the other and and we we do whatever uh is within uh, our means to, to do that uh yeah producing content etc but then ultimately it's it's just that it's just but, using but look, the tools that we have at our disposal in order to provide a, some sort of service yeah but you see but see when so on the outs on the face of it yes we're producing content but in reality i mean right now but in reality we've been talking for two and a half hours um and it's an occasion for us to talk more, to see where there are commonalities and where there are uh, disagreements and how <clears throat> someone else is approaching this and why. So it's, we're not, te we're technically perhaps producing content, but ultimately we aren't. Uh, essentially, Go on. Yeah. No, no. Maybe that's not this agree. No, so no, no, essentially no. what we're doing is we're having a conversation. We're getting to know each other better. Uh, and so that's you're all then we're already outside the 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 the, the machinations, I think. Uh, and and this is uh, we can also end with this. This is why I yeah. I personally like Joe Rogan. Because uh, Joe Rogan does this. Uh, people can agree or disagree and I see everyone going berserk about Joe Rogan and what he does etc sometimes every now and then with the hype spot but see I I, I do listen to, to some of uh, the his conversations and it's it's basically this and I think this is this is why people tune in to, to, to his podcast because what he does is creates this space uh, to, to get to know each other between uh, himself and and his guests and it yeah it's not it's yeah it's uh, you they get to know each other and at the same time you're you're tuning into some sort of you know conversation where it, you're just learning something new maybe even not uh, but a lot of his episodes with with comedians are just you know rants and ramblings and stuff but it's just it's interesting like this is 
so yeah you're right like it's it's we're we're not it, it's just the kind it's, of conversation where we are getting to know each other and if there's anyone out there who's interested in in listening to this well you're welcome as well right it's just yeah creating this space for dialogue where you get to know Which, each other creates yeah. uh some sort of dialogue agreements disagreements and it's just where i Which, i personally so, had fun yeah i mean we wouldn't be still be sitting here two and a half hours later <laughs> um the thing is though you know there's so what what we grew up with is of course television and on television you have two or three minute segments uh and those are maybe not scripted but they are certainly in some sense pre-scripted um in the sense that everybody basically already knows what will be said even if it's a controversial um uh, uh, uh segment it's a segment it has this is it you know 30 seconds of this and this and this and this and they've got a, they've got a teleprompter running etc now within academia unfortunately very often colleagues do not have time to sit down with another colleague and just have a philosophic conversation it's 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 always in it's always formal which has its merits uh someone presents a talk then there are questions but that can also just become a bit performative let's say and and you see young kids becoming performers as well you know uh but very rarely have i seen just an open conversation between colleagues, between professors who would just meet. Um, I don't know why that no longer is the case. I know that Heidegger took walks with 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 Nate Torp. He took his students to, and I tried to do this. I did this as well. I took students uh, to the pub, et cetera, just to have weird philosophical conversations. Um, but so very often these dialogues don't take place within, at least in my experience, within academia. Yeah, and that's uh, that's also partly why I started uh, this podcast. This has been uh, ongoing on and off before it was a uh, before I started. First time I started, it was a podcast in in Arabic, trying to yeah mimic the Joe Rogan thing, and then I switched it to marketplace discussions in English. It was a lecture series. I would invite people to give lectures. But then for the convenience of scheduling, uh, I decided to just turn it into a podcast because it's easier to get people from across the globe to have a chat with, uh, get to know each other on the one hand, but on the other hand, learn a thing or two as well. I, this is uh, really the reason be behind this. And it's, it's easier to schedule uh, because before it was synchronous lectures but i had to do them on tuesdays yeah. at 7 p.m because uh, that would work for uh, the majority of people but then you lose everyone across like p people who are uh, busy or people people who are who just cannot do that so yeah a podcast is is much better i record whenever and then i post it out there and and i write an article about the podcast so it's it's also in a ah, way getting me to yeah i uh it's 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 a newsletter but then it's not a podcast show notes it's i actually sit down and write an article yeah excellent. based off of the podcast so it's getting me to first off get to meet people i'm reading all sorts of stuff i'm writing as well so it's a win for me win for everyone it's a win 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 whatever so yeah uh <laughs> but uh it, this this has been really enjoyable i know it's it's been two hours and and probably 40 minutes now but it's one of uh, those podcasts or discussions where i didn't even feel like it's been two hours and 30 minutes probably uh like this is an in indication for us that it's been enjoyable i don't know about uh people who are tuning in but doesn't really matter if people have listened thus far where they where can they find you yeah thank you very much Mahmoud again for the invitation I uh I I feel the same uh very briefly um uh, if people type in my name and maybe you can leave a link there's a, a YouTube channel Johannes Niederhauser and there's not that many Johannes Niederhausers so 
Uh, you'll, you'll find me quickly. And um, there's, well, and then there's my my website, my, my Halkeon Academy, um, where people can sign up to courses. And that's the best way to support the work to yeah. sign up for a course. Sounds good. And I will, I will link them uh, all both in the article I'm going to write. I still don't know uh, the, the angle I'm going to be taking, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link all that both in the description and in the article. Thank you very much for the discussion. This has been really fun and it's always good to see Likewise. unlike academia people who are doing something similar and we all end up supporting each other one way or the other because yep. i mean we're in this together and we understand how difficult it can be to it's, you know it's do difficult this. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll yeah. have mahmoud will have you on so this is uh after this is out on your channel will be on mine to continue yeah i'm uh, i'm looking forward and next time we'll 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 probably talk about i don't know whatever uh comes up when when we have this discussion thank you very much uh johannes Excellent. and thank you everyone for listening thanks everyone bye